Good morning. Welcome to class 10 ICAC Chemistry. Today we are going to solve the sample paper of chemistry board examination. So, let us look at our question number 1. Question number 1 says, choose the correct answer from the options given below. A strong electrolyte from the following is and you have been given choices A, B, C, D. Now in your paper you have to just write first sub part of question 1A and you just write either A, B, C or D. Now here the keyword is strong. What does that strong mean? Strong electrolyte means almost completely ionized. So can we take acetic acid? It is not a strong electrolyte because it is a, an organic compound and organic compounds, organic acids, they are partially dissociated. Same thing for oxalic acid, organic acid, ammonium hydroxide, the cation ammonium is a non-metallic cation so definitely this will not be strong. So the correct answer will be D which is sodium hydroxide. Now let us look at second sub part. Electron affinity is maximum in now al the alkali metals that are here they are from group 1A. Now electron affinity of group 1A is going to be the least and as we go to the right of the periodic table from left to right electron affinity is going to increase. So on the right will be halogens definitely not inert gases. Why? Because inert gases have zero electron affinity. So here it will be C which is halogen. Let us come to the third one. The main components of brass are now brass has copper and zinc. So we have A. That's the first one. The drying agent used to dry ammonia. Now ammonia is basic in nature. So you will have to take something which is basic from here which will not react with this. So this one is acidic. So no, this is an acid. So no, this gives a compound uh, combining with ammonia addition compound. So no, and this will be CaO. Why? Because it is basic will not react with basic ammonia. Come to the fifth one. General formula of alkynes is now alkynes is CnH2n minus 2. Now you have to know that by heart. So that is. Let us come to question 1b. Write balanced chemical equations. Now here you need to know the reactants and the products well. Catalytic oxidation of ammonia. So we write in the first part NH3 plus O2 because it's the oxidation and for oxidation our catalyst is platinum and the temperature is 700 degrees C to 800 degrees C and your product is going to be nitric oxide plus it will be H2O and plus it will be 21.4 kilo calorie heat. So now you will see that the balanced reaction would be 4 NH3 to give 4 NO and you will have 6 H2O and that will balance out your oxygen as 5O2. This is your first reaction. The second reaction. Now second reaction is action of concentrated nitric acid on sulfur. So we talk about the second reaction. Now sulfur plus you will have concentrated nitric acid is HNO3 and we will write conch that is concentrated and here sulfur gets oxidized to H2SO4 and the products when conch nitric acid reacts with metals or non-metals is H2O plus NO2 which is going to give you up arrow and so you will have sulfur with 6 HNO3 you will have to remember this and then we will have 
sulfur with 6 HNO3 conch on heating gives H2SO4 plus 2H2O plus 6 NO2 up arrow. We now move on to our third one. Third one is action of concentrated, so concentrated sodium hydroxide on <coughs> zinc oxide. Now you have zinc oxide which is an amphoteric oxide plus you'll write NaOH. Now with sodium hydroxide this will give complex salt and water. Complex salt with sodium and ZNO is Na2 ZNO2 plus H2O. And so balancing this out Na2 will give you 2 NaOH. Check all everything is balanced so that is your balance reaction there. Let us come to the next one. Reaction between acetic acid and ethanol in presence of concentrated sulfuric acid. So now concentrated sulfuric acid <coughs> is the catalyst. So acetic acid is going to be CH3COOH and ethanol is C2H5OH and it's a reversible reaction but in presence of concentrated sulfuric acid you will write conch sulfuric acid and that will give us this OH and this H will give us this 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 hydrogen and this OH will give us water and we'll have the C2H5 coming here to replace this hydrogen and that would give us CH3, COO, C2H5 plus H2. Now remember this reaction is also reversible. So when you write this, you have to write here dry hydrogen chloride gas. We come to the fifth one. The fifth one is action of dilute hydrochloric acid on iron and here we will have iron plus HCl dilute and that will require two of this HCl because iron will take chloride and it will become FeCl2 plus it will be hydrogen displaced. So that's your balance reaction. Now let us come to the next question which is write the observations. Now for the observations when we are writing I would just discuss these fast without writing to save on time. Let us look at the reactions. Dry dilute sulfuric acid is added to silver nitrate. Now silver nitrate has silver, hydrochloric acid will have chlorine. So you will have silver chloride and what would be your answer? Now if you have pen and paper then you can just keep it on pause and quickly write that a curdy white precipitate of silver chloride is formed which is insoluble in dilute HNO3 but soluble in excess NH4OH solution forming diamine silver chloride solution into bracket colorless. Let's come to the second one concentrated nitric acid. Now here the key word is concentrated because concentrated nitric acid when it reacts with the metal it will first first uh, observation will be the evolution of nitrogen dioxide gas. Now what is the color of nitrogen dioxide gas? That NO2 that is liberated is going to be dense reddish brown fumes. And because it's copper turnings, copper will make it uh, itself can get converted into copper nitrate which will be blue in color. So we will write over here dense reddish brown vapors or fumes of nitrogen dioxide are evolved with the solution becoming blue in color. Why? Because copper will form copper nitrate which is blue in color. 
Next, we come to the mixture of ammonium chloride and sodium hydroxide. Now, ammonium chloride will have sodium chloride forming one product and ammonium hydroxide forming the other product. Now, ammonium hydroxide is unstable and so it will split itself into H2 and NH3. So, we have ammonia. Observation for ammonia. Pungent smelling ammonia gas is liberated which gives dense white fumes of ammonium chloride. When a glass rod dipped in, conch HCl is brought near it. So that finishes our third observation. Let us come to our next observation. Your next observation, sorry this has got smudged because of some water. Ammonium hydroxide is added to excess copper sulfate. Now copper and ammonium hydroxide will give you copper hydroxide. But copper hydroxide is soluble in excess of ammonium hydroxide solution. So, it is going to make inky blue solutions for your observation. Quickly you can note it down. Pale blue precipitate of copper hydroxide is formed which dissolves in excess of ammonium hydroxide forming inky blue solution of tetraamine copper 2 sulfate. Let us come to the fourth subpart. Ammonium hydroxide solution is added in excess to copper sulfate solution. Here you have to understand that copper will react with this hydroxide. It will do double decomposition reaction and it will form pale blue precipitate of copper hydroxide which will be soluble in excess of ammonium hydroxide giving inky blue solution of tetraamine copper 2 sulfate. So you need to write the entire observation till in excess. Look at the fifth one. NaOH solution is added to calcium nitrate solution. Here again you will see double decomposition reaction. Tell me what it will be. That's right. Calcium hydroxide will be there. Now this calcium hydroxide is going to form milky white precipitate which will be insoluble in excess of NaOH solution. Let us come to rewrite the following by inserting appropriate word or words. Number one, magnesium nitride reacts with, is it water? No, it is warm water. So you got to insert that word to liberate ammonia. Second one, lead bromide conducts electricity. Does lead bromide conduct in solid state? No. It is in, so you have to say lead bromide, it will be fused or molten lead bromide conducts electricity. We come to starch iodide paper. It turns blue black in presence of chlorine. It will be moist starch iodide paper. Hydrogen chloride molecule contains a covalent bond. Now, hydrogen chloride difference between electronegativities is large. So it's going to be not just covalent bond but polar covalent bond. We come to the last one here. <clears throat> the last one is acid salts are formed by replacement of ionizable hydrogen ions of the acid by a metallic ion or ammonium ion. So, acid salts are formed by, if it's acid salt, it will have H in that salt. So, it won't be, if it's sulfate, it will not be just sulfate, it will be bisulfate, which means HSO4 radical will be there, which means it will be not a replacement, but partial replacement of ionizable hydrogen ion. So, that is the word to be inserted, which is the word partial. Let us now come to the next question. In the next question, I have already marked the volumes of gases which are given. But when we solve this, we need to solve it on the paper. 
So when we are solving it on the paper, we will have to write the equation. So 2C2H6 plus 7O2 gives 4CO2 plus 6H2O. Now out here, we are given 2000 cc of oxygen. So on top of oxygen, I shall write 2000 cc. Ethane is 400. So here I'll write 400 cc. They are asking us to find the, find the volume of CO2. So I'll write volume equal to how much. And we also want to know the unused oxygen. Now unused oxygen means this oxygen is in excess. So I will directly come to 400 cc of ethane representing two volumes. Now this is a gas, this is a gas, this is a gas and this is steam. So we'll apply Gay-Lussac's law which means two volume is to seven volumes gives four volumes is to six volumes. And I'm going to write over here Gay-Lussac's law. Now in order to get our calculations right, we are going to say 400 cc of vol uh, volume of ethane are representing two volumes of ethane in the equation. So one volume will be equal to 200 cc. So this two volume will write as 2 into 200 cc. That gives you 400 which is the same as this. Now oxygen will not be all 2000 because 7 volumes means 7 into 200 cc will be required. That will give us 4 into 200 cc is to 6 into 200 cc. Now looking at this we will see that the volume of ethane used is totally 400 so nothing will be left over. But for oxygen, it will be 7 to 1400 cc, but we have 2000 cc, which means we have the unused oxygen also will be uh, there remaining as balance. How much of volume of CO2 will be formed? 4 into 200. So immediately we can say, therefore, volume of CO2 at STP is going to be 4 into volume of CO2 at STP will be 4 into 200 cc which is going to give us 800 cc. So this becomes our answer 1. Come to the unused oxygen. So now we come to unused oxygen at STP will be 2000 minus used oxygen which means it will be 2000 minus 7 into 200 which is 2000 minus 1400 which is going to be 600 cc. And that becomes your answer. That becomes our answer two. <clears throat> Let us come to the next question. Our next question is Find the number of moles and molecules present in 7.1 gram of chlorine. Now, we want number of moles and molecules and we have been given mass of chlorine and that is equal to 7.1 gram. Which means we need to find first the gram molecular mass of chlorine. And that will be, can you see this? Chlorine has been given over here, 35.5. So it will be Cl2 means 2 into 35.5, which is equal to 71 gram. And then we are going to say, 
सेवन पॉइंट वन ग्राम ऑफ क्लोरिन हैज वन मोल इन इट सो सेवन पॉइंट वन ग्राम ऑफ क्लोरिन हैज एक्स ना कैन वी डू द कैलकुलेशन एक्स विल बी इक्वल टू सेवन पॉइंट वन मल्टीप्लाइड बाय वन अपॉन सेवेंटी वन That gives us seventy one upon ten into one upon seventy one, which is one upon ten, and that gives us x equal to zero point one mole of CO two. So this is our answer. We also have to find the number of molecules. So now this becomes your answer one. and for the second part second part we need to think about the molecules now we have 71 g of cl2 and you know that it is making up one mole now one mole is going to have 6.023 into 10 to the power 23 molecules This is according to the Avogadro's law. So, seven point one gram of Cl two has how many molecules? Let us see how we do the working. The working will be seven point one into six point zero two three into ten to the power twenty three divided by seventy one. That gives us seventy one upon ten multiplied by six point zero two three into ten to the power twenty three upon seventy one, which gets cancelled, and you will have one upon ten. So it is point one multiplied by the Avogadro's number six point zero two three into ten to the power twenty three, and that is the number of molecules and that is our answer to let's come to the third sub part calculate the vapor density of ethene now ethene if we remember the formula the formula is C two H four. Now, <clears throat> in order to find the vapor density, you have to see the relation between ethene. We know the formula. We also have been for ethene. We know the formula, and we also have been supplied with the atomic weights. So first thing we will do is find RMM. So we will have RMM of ethene that is C two H four will be equal to two into twelve. That's the mass of carbon, the relative molecular, uh, uh, relative atomic mass of carbon, and hydrogen is. Four into one. That gives us twenty-four plus four, which is twenty-eight. And we know the relation between RMM, that is molecular weight. We know molecular weight is equal to two multiplied by vapor density, which means vapor density is equal to molecular weight upon two. Molecular weight is twenty eight upon two, so vapor density will be two divides here, so that will give us fourteen as the. Let us come to question one F. Identify the terms. Now, mostly, if you know your definitions well, this will go very fast. What is the first one? Energy required to remove an electron from valence shell. Of a neutral isolated gaseous atom, this becomes ionization potential. 
method of concentration of sulfide ores the keyword over here is sulfide ore that is from flotation method property by which carbon atoms with itself they form a long chain that's catenation a bond formed by a shared pair of electrons with both electrons coming from the same atom this becomes coordinate bond and the last one the substance that conducts electricity in molten or aqueous state and this becomes your electrovalent compound let's come to question 1g now for a question like this according to the instructions where they ask you about the periodic table and even chemical bonding especially for these two you need to have the periodic table in front of you which i've kept ready just now now you should be able to do this during the examination just mark it in pencil somehow so that you'll be able to do full justice to that now you have li f and n increasing order of electronegativity now electronegativity that is en increases across the period so you look at it li f and n where are they li f and n so increasing order will be from left to right so our first one is going to be your li the second one is going to be your n and the third one is going to be f okay now let us come to the second one na alcl increasing order of ionization potential now we know in the periodic table this is your group 1a this way it will have the least ionization potential this one will have 7a will be having the maximum ionization potential so ionization potential is also increasing across the period and these are period 3 can you see this sodium aluminium and chlorine so they are already in the increasing order so this order will remain the same this will be the increasing order of ionization potential then we come to the next one the next one is where we have oxygen nitrogen and chlorine now out here a thinking step oxygen is o double bond o nitrogen is n triple bond n and chlorine is cl single bond cl our question is increasing num order of number of covalent bonds now covalent bonds are maximum nitrogen so you start with chlorine so our answer will be chlorine first then comes oxygen with two single covalent bonds and then we come to nitrogen which is n triple bond 3 we now come to the next question the next question talks about <clears throat> na zn na and cu all of them are cations zn2 plus na2 plus and cu2 plus order of preference of discharge at the cathode now for this you have to know your ec series by heart which one is the lowest that one will be discharge first so preference will be from the lowest now sodium you know is the topmost copper you know is below hydrogen so first one to discharge will be cu2 plus the second one will be zn2 plus and the third one will be na1 plus so that will be your order br f and chlorine now for this again is periodic table so i'm just bringing before you this uh the same one that we used earlier now this is the part of halogens and halogens are group seven as we go down the group the number of atomic shells are going to increase so the electron shells are increasing this will be two shells three shells four shells etc so we start with decreasing order so you start with the lowest one so it will be now 
br then we will have going up chlorine and then going up it will be chlorine so that's how the decreasing atomic radius would be there now for the structural formula for the structural formula you will see that first one is but one in what does in mean to us in means it is double bond what does but mean to us it is four carbon so we are going to have c single bond c single bond c single bond c and the first one will have double bond so first one will have double bond like this now each carbon has to have four valencies so i will have like this two valencies here one two three four valency so one more valency here one two so three and four and then here it will be three valencies so our structure becomes h here h here h here also h here also h and this is how we will complete the structure and that becomes but one in next one is propanoic acid what does prop mean to you three carbons n means what single bonds so keep this ready c single bond c single bond c and now we will have proper noic acid this oic acid means the carbon the last carbon will be having dash cooh so i'm going to show here double bond o and single bond oh so this part becomes cooh which becomes oic acid and then remaining carbons make sure each has four valencies this one has one two so three and four and this is your oic acid so that becomes proper noic acid now we come to ethanol what does eth mean two carbons n means what single bond so c mm. single bond c and then the first carbon will have four valencies with all h's and this particular will have again three valencies remaining balance so total there are one two three four this is hydrogen this is hydrogen and this is oh so that becomes your ethanol lastly we come to the structural isomers of c4h10 now c4h10 is butane now butane the first one will be n butane now your n butane will be c single bond c single bond c single bond c that is but four carbons and all single bonds so it will be ch3 ch2 ch3 like so this will be h everywhere we write h per carbon complete four valency check every time so this becomes your n butane or just simply butane we come to the isomer of butane so the isomer will be again c single bond c single bond c but the last carbon that ch3 group skips this and attaches here so it will be attaching here it will become ch3 and so per carbon there will be four valencies one here and three remaining so these will be taken by h so that becomes your ch3 then this carbon has three valencies so fourth one and we'll put h here and last carbon has one valency here you will add three more and that will give you ch3 here and this ch3 which is attached will be h h and h so that becomes one two three becomes prop 
single bond becomes ale and because second carbon has methyl group it becomes it becomes 2 methyl through 2 methyl propane now this one is isobutane and it is also 2 methyl propane so now let us come to the isomer isomer will be c single bond c single bond c but now this ch3 will attach itself not to this carbon third one but the second one so i'm not writing this ch3 here but it's skipping this one that is this its script and it's come here so that becomes c single bond with three single bonds here for that one and this will become ch3 so we have this ch3 attaching itself here to the second one first carbon will have three more valencies total up will be four valencies so we will write h everywhere this carbon has three valencies fifth one becomes h this becomes one two three and each one will be taking up h and so you will have the name of this is isobutane but IUPAC name you will have to look at the longest chain that is three carbons so that is prop and it is all single bonds so it is propane and the second carbon has got CH3 group CH3 group is methyl so it becomes second carbon means two methyl propane that finishes our section one let us come to section two now section two of this paper starts with a asking us to write balanced equations for the following conversions now we have a, B, C and D. These are our four conversions. Four conversions for four marks. So, we will first write what is your A. A is ZnCO3 is going to give us ZnNO3 twice. What do we have to prepare? A nitrate. What have we been given? Zinc carbonate. That means zinc is Zn is taken care of. So this Zn will come from ZnCO3. And now we have to bring in nitrate. So wiser to take HNO3 dilute. And now you will see that it becomes double decomposition reaction. And so I will have H2CO3 form so I'll balance this and I will get zinc with nitrate paired up so ZnNO3 twice and plus it will be plus H2O plus CO2 up arrow. We come to the second reaction. A second reaction is ZnNO3 twice is going to give us ZnOH twice. Now out here again we are going to look at zinc will come from zinc nitrate so I will write what we have been given with that is zinc nitrate and for this OH I can take NaOH I can take NH4OH as well but now I will take the double decomposition reaction 
and zinc will become with OH zinc formula with hydroxide is ZnOH twice so I'll write 2 here and I shall get in addition to that 2 NaNO3 we come now to the C reaction now C reaction is ZnOH twice gives us ZnSO4 now for ZnNO3 twice and ZnSO4 this is my C reaction zinc has already come from ZnOH twice this is already supplied for SO4 now because this is a base I can take H2SO4 acid and that will give me again a double decomposition reaction which gives me ZnSO4 plus H and OH means H2O so 2 H2O now let us come to D reaction D reaction is ZnSO4 gives you ZnCO3 so D reaction is ZnSO4 gives us ZnCO3 can you see the question all right now that we have got that much zinc will come from ZnSO4 so I'll have to take carbonate now remember zinc carbonate is an insoluble substance so it will have to come as a precipitate so I will take Na2CO3 and again I shall do double decomposition and zinc will get paired up with CO3 which will be down arrow and plus it will give me Na2SO4 so that is our reaction D <clears throat> B is show the formation of HCO1 plus using for a hydronium ion we have to start with the structure of water now water is with oxygen oxygen has one two three four five and six electrons and they are shared with hydrogen and hydrogen when water combines with a proton that is a hydrogen ion hydrogen is deficient in electrons and oxygen has two lone pairs of electrons so this lone pair is given to the hydrogen and now our structure looks like so these two electrons this is the lone pair this is also the second lone pair which will be given to this hydrogen and the earlier hydrogens they will remain the same but now overall because one proton has got added the whole structure will have one plus charge this will show itself as hydrogen with single bond with oxygen with single bond with another hydrogen this lone pair which didn't get shared and this lone pair was totally donated to hydrogen will be shown as coordinate bond and the whole structure will be shown with this positive charge and that is your H3O1 plus which is hydronium ion state the types of bonds so we shall write the types of bonds that are present in this
types of bonds number one you can see these ones are single covalent bonds and the second one is coordinate bond so this is how our answer looks like now they are telling you to distinguish between the following pairs of compounds using the tests that are given in brackets. Let us come to question 2c that is distinguished between the following pairs of compounds. Now when we do a question like this, we need to have the paper and we need to make three columns. So we'll have a column number one, which will be for the test. Then we'll have the column two and the column three. And we will be writing, the first column will be our test. Then we are going to write calcium, sulfite and calcium carbonate okay now what is different over here is this sulfite and this is carbonate sulfite this is our thinking step sulfite is going to be SO3 2 minus and carbonate is going to be CO3 2 minus which means if I add a dilute acid in each, I will have evolution of gases. So let us write add dilute HCl to each. And here it will say calcium sulfide will liberate SO2. So we will say if colorless sulfur dioxide gas smelling of burning sulfur you can also say having suffocated odor suffocating odor which turns lime water milky and acidified K2Cr2O7 solution from orange to clear green then SO3 2 minus present therefore calcium sulfite present If it is calcium carbonate, we are going to have a brisk effervescence of carbon dioxide because it's carbonate. So we write if brisk effervescence of colorless carbon dioxide gas is evolved. Now remember this is colorless as well as odorless evolved then also we have one more test which is which turns lime water milky but has no effect on acidified K2Cr2O7 solution that is potassium dichromate solution then 
carbonate that is CO3 2 minus is present therefore calcium carbonate now we come to the second test calcium nitrate and potassium nitrate using flame test so we will continue with this now we'll talk about the second and the second test is here test is using flame test And here it will be, what is our word, a given calcium nitrate and potassium nitrate. So we will write calcium nitrate and potassium nitrate. So we know the description for flame test so we use the platinum wire we clean it nicely we dip it in calcium nitrate with HCl and then we introduce it to the non luminous part of the flame now here the cation is calcium and here it is potassium so calcium will give you brick red flame so you will say if brick red flame is seen then Ca2 plus present therefore calcium nitrate present now for potassium if non persistent lilac flame is seen then the cation will be potassium and therefore it would be potassium nitrate our last one is lead nitrate and zinc nitrate solution using alkali. So, we will write over here lead nitrate. And here we will write zinc nitrate. And understand that they have written over here solution and here as well it is given as solution in your question and they say use an alkali now for alkali understand if I take sodium hydroxide lead and zinc both will give soluble in excess precipitate of hydroxides but if I take ammonium hydroxide then zinc will be soluble in excess and lead will not be soluble in excess of it. So we will write over here the third test is using alkali and you will say NH4OH solution that is ammonium hydroxide. Now ammonium hydroxide, this OH will react with this and it will give me lead hydroxide. The description for which is if, what is it? Chalky white precipitate of lead hydroxide. insoluble in excess of NH4OH solution then Pb2 plus present therefore lead nitrate 
solution present. On the other hand, for zinc, you will have if gelatinous white precipitate of zinc hydroxide. See, we have this zinc will react with this OH over here. It will give you zinc hydroxide. <coughs> which is soluble in excess NH4OH solution. Then Zn2 plus present and therefore we will say zinc nitrate solution present. So this is how we write the distinguishing questions which will have absolutely no chance of you losing your marks because you have written everything properly. We come to question 3. A part says study the table and answer the following questions. The atom A and B have atomic number 11 and 17. Compare the positions of A and B in the periodic table. Which is more metallic? Write the equation for each one of them, A and B, for the formation of their ions. Anytime you have a question like this, immediately you have to have the electronic configuration. So in your mind, you should have 2A to 1. And here it will be 2, 8, 7. So this is your thinking step. So your A will be group 1A and your B is going to be group 7A or 17. So that is the position which is more metallic. The one which is going to lose the electron easily becomes the metallic and also the one which will have 1, 2, 3 in the valence shell electrons. So that makes it which is more metallic A. Equation for the formation of ions of A. A is having one electron. So A is going to lose that electron and it is going to become A1+. plus. So the reaction would be A minus one electron gives A1+. plus. On the other hand, for B, it is 287. So your B is going to become, by accepting one electron, it will be like so. Therefore, B will gain one electron to make sure that it is having eight electrons in the valence shell and that will become B1 minus. So this is one plus, this is one minus. What type of bond is formed between A and B? Now A becomes a cation, B becomes an anion and so it is going to be electrovalent bond. Mention its physical state and solubility. Now physical state, because it's an electrovalent compound, it is going to be a hard crystalline solid and it's going to be soluble in water. Let's come to question 3b. 
identify the gas evolved in each of the following cases. A colorless gas liberated on decomposition of nitric acid. Now for a question like this, you need to know the reactions by heart. So decomposition of nitric acid, you should know this reaction by heart. Now there are two gases over here. This one is a colored gas. This is the colorless gas. So which one is the colorless gas? Oxygen. Water is added to calcium carbide. You need to know this reaction too. If you know this reaction, from organic chemistry, this is the gas which is acetylene. Dilute hydrochloric acid with zinc sulfide. This sulfide with any acid is going to give you hydrogen sulfide. So it is going to give you hydrogen sulfide. Dilute nitric acid is added to copper. Dilute nitric acid will always end up giving you these products, which is the gas NO means what? Nitric oxide. Let's move on to question number four. Write the balanced equation for the following C2H5Br plus alcoholic KOH. Now, alcoholic KOH results in unsaturation. So, this C2H5 is CH3CH2Br, which means your thinking step, I'll just write over here, CH3CH2, and this will be your Br, CH3CH2Br. And so, this H and this Br is going to go. Br will be taken by K, H will be taken by OH, and what we will get is C2H4. Can you see this? This is C with 2H, this with 2H, so it becomes C2H4 plus KBr plus H2O because we have this H going with this OH. We come to CH3CH2COONA plus soda lime. Soda lime, the formula is NaOH. And on top of this arrow, we will write CaO. So total, this is your soda line and you need to heat it. And for this, you will have decarboxylation. And that will give you this H going with this and you will have CH3 single bond CH3. That gives you C2H6 plus Na2. COO, CO3. We come to the next one. C2H4 plus Br2. Now C2H4 is your thinking step. This is how the structure looks like. Which means with bromine, it will have addition reaction taking place with this valency opening up. And so you are going to have <coughs> the condition will be in CCl4 and that is the inert solvent. And that will give you the two have got added up over here. The structure wise it will be like so with one Br here and one Br here. So this will be your H, H, this will be again H <clears throat> and H. So this becomes 1, 2, dibromoethane. We come to the last reaction here, C2H5OH plus Na. Now sodium is going to displace this and it is going to form C2H5ONA and it's going to displace hydrogen. So when it displaces hydrogen, it's going to have two of this with 
2 of this giving you 2 of this and H2. So that's your reaction. We come to B. B is ethyl chloride to ethyl alcohol. Now ethyl chloride is C2H5 which is the ethyl group and chloride and we want from this giving you C2H5 ethyl alcohol means OH group. So this ethyl group has come from here. So I'll have to put something with OH. So I will write KOH and KOH will give me double decomposition reaction taking place C2H5OH plus KCl. Now when I have KCl, this is going to be aqueous KOH and on top of this arrow we will write boil. Ethyl alcohol to ethene. So we have C2H5OH and from that we have to prepare ethene which will be C double bond C because E means alkene group. So it's going to be like so. You will see that here it is CH3, CH2 that is C2H5. So there is a single bond which has become double bond which means one H and one OH has gone which means I have H2O has been removed from this and that can happen only using a dehydrating agent like concentrated H2SO4 and this will be at 170 degrees C ethyl bromide to ethane now ethyl bromide is CH3CH2Br and I have to prepare ethane which is CH3 single bond CH3 this is what has been prepared which means you will see that this bromine has been removed and it has been replaced by H. So here we will have two nascent hydrogen added to this and that will be with the condition ZnCu couple in alcohol. So you will see that Let us come to question 4C. Give the correct IUPAC name for each of the compounds whose structural formulae are given below. The first one, this is the structural formula. Always look out for the functional group. This is aldehydic group. So, it's going to end in AL. How many carbons? 3. So, it becomes prop. So, it is prop single bonds between carbon so it's going to be in but we don't write this e and then we write the functional group a and l so it is proper null the second one the functional group this is going to be ol because it is alcoholic group one two three carbons so it is again prop single bonds so in and then this will end functional group in O L. We come to the next one. You will see the functional group. This is dash COOH carboxylic acid group, which means it is going to end in oic acid. One, two, three, four. So it is but. So it is but and all single bonds between carbon. So in and butanoic acid. We come to question number 5. 
E. Name the chief ore of aluminium. Chief ore of aluminium is bauxite. So it's going to be bauxite and is going to be Al2O3 dot 2H2O. The name is hydrated aluminium oxide. The process of concentration, which means removing the impurity, is going to be Bayer's process. Write the balanced equation for the conversion of the above ore of aluminium to so ore of aluminium is Al2O3 dot 2H2O plus 2NaOH is going to be at 150 degrees C to 200 degrees C will give us sodium aluminate that is NaAlO2 but it will be 2 Al NaAlO2 and plus it will be 3H2O. Name one alloy of aluminium. You can write either magnalium or duralmin. I am writing duralmin. Now duralmin is the alloy which has aluminium, magnesium, copper and manganese. The compound gave a following date. So carbon is 57.82%, oxygen is 38.58% and rest is hydrogen. So when it is the percentage of hydrogen required, we will have to first add these two. So when we are adding these 8 and 2, 10, carry 1, 8 and 6, 14, carry 1, 7 and 9, 16, carry 1 it is 96.40 percent and so your percentage of hydrogen is going to be equal to 100 minus 96.40 this is going to be the percentage of hydrogen now hydrogen comes out to be 3.6 percent by its empirical formula molecular formula and relative molecular mass that means RMM is given as 1. So now our columns are ready as you can see we have the first column keep this structure ready like this and we will write the first one being the element. Second one is your percentage, third one is your atomic weight, then we have the relative number of atoms and then we have the simple ratio. The first element I want to write is hydrogen. We have already shown here hydrogen percentage. So 3.6% atomic weight is 1. Then we will write carbon and then we will write oxygen. Carbon is 57.82%. Atomic weight is 12. Oxygen is 38.82%. 58% and here atomic weight is 16. The relative number of atoms will be 3.6 divided by 1 which is 3.6. Then we have 57.82 divided by 12 and here it will be 38.58 divided by 16. Now it is always wiser to do our working column here itself. 
there are two divisions required so we will make two columns here so side by side we can just write this for carbon you'll divide by 12 and you are dividing 57.82 12 pos 48 and we will have 9 12 goes 8 times 96 okay so that will give you 2 here and it's going approximately twice we come to for oxygen 16 will be dividing 38.58 so 16 twos 32 remain 6 I'm bringing this and it will go 16 4 64 and I'm bringing this 8 down it will go once and so write these numbers 4.82 and here it will be 2.41 the method is absolutely clear to get the simple ratio we will have to divide each one of them by the least one of them. So 3.6 divided by 2.41, then 4.82 divided by 2.41, and 2.41 divided by 2.41. This will give us um, if you shift the decimal, this will be 36 and this will be 24.1. Now 24.1 we write, but we will take only two, 24 for our calculations. So after shifting the decimal, 12 will go 3 times and 12 will go twice. This will give me 1.5. This is going twice. And here... We need the simple ratio, we do not want a fraction. So you'll have to make this simple by multiplying this by 2, but then every way we'll have to divide by 2. So this will be 3, this will be 4, and this will be 2. That will lead us to the empirical formula. So we will have therefore empirical formula is it will be H three C four O two according to this. Now the next step is to find empirical formula weight. And that will be equal to the mass of H. As you can see in the question, C is 12, O is 16 and H is 1. So we are going to use this. H is 3 into 1 plus carbon is 12 into 4 and oxygen is 16 into 2 which gives us 3 plus 48 plus 32 that will give us 83 now RMM is already supplied so RMM is equal to 166 that will tell us how many times it is of empirical formula weight so we will write N which is equal to molecular formula weight means what RMM upon empirical formula weight which gives us 166 upon 83 which eventually will give us two molecular formula is n times empirical formula so 
it is 2 as we, we have the value of n as 2. So we substitute for n2 and our empirical formula which we found out earlier was H3C4O2 and that gives you the n molecular formula as H6C8O4 and that is our answer. Question 6. Your part A says copy and complete the following table and we have the name of the process and catalyst, temperature and equation of the reaction and I kept all this ready so that we do not waste time. Now Haber's process has been given so we need to know what is the catalyst. The catalyst is finely divided iron. What is the temperature? The temperature is 450 to 500 degrees C and the equation is N2 plus 3H2. It's a reversible reaction. It will give us 2 NH3 which is a gas so we will put up arrow here and plus it is here 22,400 calories and also we understand that the condition here finely divided iron is already been mentioned temperature has already been mentioned so we will write the pressure which is 200 to 900 atmosphere and you also have promoter molybdenum which you can write uh, in your paper you can make this column a little larger and you can write it out there. The second subpart reads how is ammonia separated from unreacted nitrogen and hydrogen. Now here again I have the answers ready so that we can just discuss them fast and we have the techniques. Now what are the techniques by which ammonia is separated from the unreacted nitrogen and hydrogen depends upon the properties of ammonia. The properties of ammonia by number one liquefaction of ammonia as ammonia is easily liquefied but nitrogen and hydrogen cannot be easily liquefied. The second technique is we dissolve ammonia in water because ammonia is highly soluble in water. Remember this 702 volumes of ammonia will dissolve in one volume of water whereas hydrogen and nitrogen have very limited solubility in water. They are partially uh, in, uh, soluble but that is very very little solubility. It's as good as insoluble. We come to our next question. Your question B is give appropriate scientific reasons for each of the following statements and the first one reads electrolysis of molten lead bromide is considered to be a redox reaction and here we have the answer. First of all we write the, the dissociation reaction and our dissociation reaction is PBPr2 show the dissociation reversible reaction gives you Pb2 plus plus 2Br1 minus. The moment you keep this ready it helps you to answer the question clearly and logically. So Pb2 plus ions they are lead Pb2 plus cations. What happens to the cation? It migrates to cathode and gains two electrons to be reduced to lead atom. What is our reaction? Looking at this automatically we should think of this reaction. What does the reaction say? Pb2 plus will accept two electrons and it will become a neutral atom. So that is how gain of electrons becomes reduced. And bromide ion which is Br2 minus that bromine ion migrates to anode loses one electron each okay so the ions will migrate to one second I'll just come back to this so bromide ions bromide ions Br1 minus migrate to anode they lose one electron each to form bromine atoms and they get oxidized. 
Now looking at this, we should be able to think of this. So Br1 minus minus 1 electron gives you Br and there are 2 Br so you multiply this whole thing by 2 that will give you Br2 but loss of electron means it is oxidized. So we say since reduction and oxidation takes place simultaneously hence electrolysis of molten lead bromide is a redox reaction. So the second answer, although copper metal is a good conductor of electricity, why is it a bad electrolyte? Because it does not undergo chemical decomposition due to the flow of electric current and hence there are no ions discharged as neutral atoms. Hence copper is not an electrolyte. We come to the last one. It says electrical conductivity of acetic acid is less in comparison to that of dilute sulfuric acid. Now just to save on time, I have got this written down and let us just quickly glance through acetic acid. Why it would be less acidic? Because it's an organic acid. So being an organic acid, it is a weak acid when it is undergoing only partial dissociation and it produces less number of hydronium ions. So this is again another keyword less number of hydronium ions in the aqueous solution. So as a result it will have less electrical conductivity. Conductivity depends upon the formation of ions and the number of ions present. We come to dilute sulfuric acid due to more amount of water which is a polar solvent it will have more degree of dissociation as it will be almost completely ionized see the keywords here and it will form more hydronium ions so here it is again the keyword here more hydronium ions in a solution and hence it will be a better conductor of electricity our next question is mention the property of concentrated sulfuric acid exhibited in the following reactions with sugar. Now remember with sugar it will remove the water molecules from its chemical combination. So the property is dehydrating agent that is the property of sulfuric acid in this in metallic chloride. Now if there is a metallic chloride I can add H2SO4 which is a non-volatile acid and it will displace H with Cl means what? Hydrogen chloride. So here the property of sulfuric acid is non-volatile acid and why it is so? Because it has its boiling point 338 degrees C. Non-metals such as carbon. Carbon reacts with concentrated H2SO4 and becomes carbon dioxide. Reason? Concentrated H2SO4 supplies nascent oxygen which means it is oxidizing agent because it is supplying nascent oxygen. Let us come to question 7a. Answer the following questions pertaining to the laboratory preparation of hydrogen chloride. Write an equation for the laboratory preparation of hydrogen chloride. Now hydrogen chloride has this chloride so I will take rock salt which is NaCl and because it has hydrogen I will take an acid but I will take H2SO4 conch. It will be concentrated acid and then it is going to have this type of reaction taking place and the temperature will be less than 200 degrees C and Na will take HSO4 and it will form acid salt and the other H will take chlorine and it will form hydrogen chloride which is a gas. The drying agent. 
drying agent for hydrogen chloride it's an acidic gas and so it will be concentrated sulfuric acid avoid writing the formula name the method of collecting hydrogen chloride gas now hydrogen chloride gas is highly soluble in water so it will not be collected over water and also it is heavier than air so it will displace the air and air will go up and so the method of collecting is going to be by upward displacement of air. Give a test to identify the gas. Now the gas is going to fume with ammonia. So we'll take when a glass rod dipped in ammonium hydroxide solution is brought near it dense white fumes of ammonium chloride are formed So that is how we identify. This helps in identification of hydrogen chloride. Give reasons for each of the following. Direct absorption of hydrogen chloride gas in water is not preferred. Now direct absorption, I shall use the paper here itself and I'll say D give reason the first point hydrogen gas hy hydrogen chloride gas hcl gas is highly soluble in water <coughs> 452 volumes dissolve in one volume of water this causes back suction and may damage the apparatus hence direct absorption of HCl gas in water is not preferred We come to the second part. Our second give reason says all glass apparatus, all glass apparatus in the preparation of nitric acid in the laboratory. Now, <clears throat> nitric acid is highly corrosive in nature. And it attacks rubber <clears throat> and cork. Hence, all glass, including the stoppers, apparatus 
is used. The third one. Our third one, NaCl has high melting point. Now the key word over here is high melting point means too much heat is required. And that happens because NaCl is what type of compound is an electrovalent compound and has Na1 plus that is the cation and Cl1 minus that is the anion held together by a strong electrostatic force of attraction. This force is overcome when large amount of heat is supplied in order to melt it. Hence, NaCl has a high melting point. We now come to C of question 7. Give one point of difference, just one point of difference between the following pairs. First one is calcination and roasting. So I have just written this down so that it is quicker. Calcination, just one point. So you make the table like this. I kept this ready for the first subpart then the second subpart and also for the third subpart i kept this ready so calcination and roasting process of heating the ore in limited supply of air or absence of air at a temperature just below its melting point now these ones are the definitions you have to know by heart roasting is the process of heating the ore in excess of air to a high temperature before it is reduced to metal now The second one is polar and non-polar covalent compound. So here again, I kept this ready to save on time. We write like so, polar covalent compound, non-polar covalent compound. Now polar covalent compound has the polarity form, which means the shared pair of electrons is unequally distributed. The keyword being unequally distributed and therefore there is charge separation. But in non-polar covalent compound, shared pair of electrons is equally distributed. So there will be no charge separation. We come to the last question, strong electrolyte and weak electrolyte. Again, we are going back to the columns that we are having. Strong electrolyte, weak electrolyte, right in two columns. Now strong means it will have mostly ions, so it will be completely, almost completely dissociated. So electrolyte, almost completely dissociated, so it will have mostly ions. These are the keywords. Whereas for weak electrolyte, electrolyte partially dissociated. The keyword here is partially and so it will not have all ions. It will have ions and molecules. That makes it a weak electrolyte. Now with this we come to the end of the paper. I hope you have now understood how to think, how to plan and how to present your work. All the best for all of you.
Thank you for watching. Thank you for watching. Thank you for watching.